machine learning yet for design of our structures, but maybe after hearing all of this, we should, and maybe that, that will be the next thing that's coming. Um, anyway, so, so you've heard all the, the scaling arguments already, um, and therefore I would also like to start with the motivation from a user case, sort of, um, as in the last talk. Um, and our particular one came from a collaborator that approached us uh, some year ago from some random car manufacturer and they build vehicles for autonomous driving and here you can see one of their cars driving in Hamburg so this is live uh, footage from a person sitting in this autonomous vehicle from Volkswagen um, going through the city without touching the wheel um, and actually the car is equipped with a lot of sensor equipment there are about 10 cameras monitoring the environment there are several LiDAR systems and radar systems, and this is all uh, overlaid to basically create an environment that is changing life. So the car basically identifies what's happening on the site, it provides feedback uh, with the engine, the accelerator, brakes, and so forth, so that the driver can actually sit there and relax, or semi-relax, <laughs> as you see. And some of the students use the car, right? the car actually already, or saw it, Frank and Daniel were there, to speak with them. Um, so this all looks very nice and works, as I said, in a, in a real city environment, but of course, as always, there's a catch, and that is if you look in the trunk of that system. Oops. There are need to, to figure out the controls. Because that's, that's where the electronic is, <laughs> right? So you need a lot of processing power and equipment to process these 10 cameras and sensors and so forth. Um, and that actually consumes a lot of computing power. This is really the issue. 
Um, you can do all of this. Um, it's bulky, but you can probably compress it. Um, but the energy consumption of this thing is an issue. So there are several graphic cards um, that could consume a few kilowatts, which maybe per se is not so bad. You say my hair dryer is doing the same. Um, but in the car that is running on electrical power with a battery, this actually significantly reduces the mileage. And it's not a small margin, but it's actually on the order of 10% or even more. And this is, of course, something the manufacturers don't want. So they're looking for something that can replace this architecture and that is probably not electronic. I don't know whether that's going to be photonic. They don't know either, but at least <laughs> I think it's worthwhile to look into this. So basically what this structure does is object recognition. And this is also something that I find fun because you have to do this quickly. There's also a nice other movie that I like. So <laughs> this is somewhat oldish with this YOLO a recognition system, maybe you know that also this is from a James Bond movie. We can actually see that classification is done live on very fast moving images. So the algorithm also identifies objects, not always correctly. So if you look closely, you can see that it gets it wrong too, but it does this at very, very fast speed with such electronic vision systems. But of course, this doesn't run on a small scale computer, but a big one, or at least one that consumes significant power. And there you saw, for example, some error. It also doesn't recognize everything, but only the things that you want to classify. But nevertheless, it's a technology that's ready. You just need to have the hardware to actually do it. And we are trying to help this development um, by solving this uh, problem that's basically at the bottom of it. So most electronic systems are built on this architecture that was conceived in the 40s by von Neumann which uh, transform basically analog to digital computing. Um, and the other issue is, of course, that you have the separation between memory and processing unit because the CPU is just not big enough to process large chunks of data. So instead, what you do is you store all your stuff in an external memory, which can be fast, you move it into the CPU and back, but everything has to go through this little bus here. And what is even more important is that the memory access, this is actually the energy expensive task. So processing is okay, but memory access, uh, access really kills you. So therefore, the architecture gets power hungry, and it's also not very good if you want to do cognitive tasks like this object recognition, which is what we humans good at, or other neural networks, but not so much such an architecture, because this is basically database search, whereas we just look at faces, can tell in an instant, and don't compare millions of pictures with this one impression. And therefore, the idea is, of course, to copy this and somehow translate it into a photonic uh, system. So really what this is all about is trying to remove the energy costs of operations down to maybe a femto tool for operation. This would be nice. Uh, it's still more than what the brain consumes. Um, but it's very far from where we are at the moment. This is roughly 300 femtojoules on uh, some good systems. And if you look a little bit closer at the metrics, then you can see that indeed it's the memory that kills you. So DRAM here, this is about uh, 100 joules per byte that you're moving. Um, if you have faster on-chip memory, this is also on the order of a few picojoules, but you know, still three orders of magnitude. Uh, above the scope, which would be compatible with um, brain-like uh, computing structures. So one of the tricks is basically to not do the separation between the two, but calculate directly in memory. This is also very much inspired by neural networks where the weights, uh, the synaptic weights, are basically your memory, but you directly use them for processing. Um, and somehow you could translate that auto in the chip architecture. Um, now with these neural networks that you have seen plenty of times now, what this basically points down to is propagating some input vector to an interconnected layer of uh, artificial neurons to some output. Um, and what you do in between these layers are very basic operations, I would say, from a mathematical point of view. Often these are matrix vector multiplications. Um, they are not so easy for a traditional computer, but easier for other architectures. But you need to do a lot of them, and you need to do this really fast. But fortunately, it maps nicely into such an in-memory computing architecture. Um, if you take this structure here and interpret the matrix that connects these layers from one to the other directly as a physical matrix, 
that is sitting on a chip. So this is one of the implementations from IBM. This is a memory store crossbar array where you basically have some inputs and then the weights are sort of resistors or programmable resistors that connect rows and columns. And, and in the end, you measure current um, and then translate that back into a digital format. So it's analog computing, um, not digital anymore. But basically, you shuffle uh, data from one side, you read it out from the other side, and the matrix itself is programmed directly into the hardware that you use for computing. Now, if you can build one of them, you make many, and then in principle, you have your network already on a chip. And this architecture is indeed very energy efficient. So, uh, state of the art is about 10 pops per watt, so a really competitive number um, that also performs at a pretty high speed. Okay, so this is well known, and therefore um, big players are also implementing that in different formats. And if you kind of look down at what you really have to do, it's basically multiply arrays of numbers uh, with each other. You can do this in a very simple way. So you take a big matrix, another big matrix that you want to multiply together, and then you go uh, row by column, basically, and build a scalar product. So this is, in the end, what the hardware does, scalar product calculation. Um, you add them all up, so this is the accumulation part, and write them out into an output matrix. This is probably not the best way to do it, because there you again have to do a lot of operations. What you always want to do is divide and conquer, to go to a size that is manageable. So instead, you break this up into smaller matrices, um, and then multiply these ones piecewise, so this one and this one, and so forth, and then you add them up into some other arrays, and in the end, uh, add them together. So with this tiling approach, what you do is you reduce your problem size to smaller matrices, and they still have the same operations, but you can now do them in parallel, because each unit could, for example, be one of these memory store crossfire arrays or so, that carries out uh, each of them efficiently and with, with low overhead. <laughs> And this is, in fact, also what some of the bigger architectures that you can already buy do. So, for example, if you take the Google TPU, uh, Google Tensor Processing Unit, um, at the heart of that system sits exactly such a thing. It's um, a systolic array, and systolic sort of refers to a kind of a, a pumping scheme. So, right from the, the heart circle, basically, where the idea is that you pump a fluid through. But here you sort of pump data through. Um, but your memory is sitting directly in the chip. Um, and then if you break this down into these little tiles, essentially what you do is you add up numbers, um, you add them with a further component, um, and then do the partial sum at the output. And uh, you can look a little bit deeper into this. Um, if you go down to the very bottom, so the building block of this historic array, what you have is a so-called multiply accumulate unit, a MAC unit. That does exactly this operation. It takes two numbers, it multiplies them together, um, it adds uh, a certain offset to it, and that is basically the output that goes to your next connection unit, and you can scale this up uh, to do exactly your calculation. So basically, you have some input that is pumped through this unit, some operations happen in here, and then you get some output that goes in two directions to the next unit, uh, in the horizontal and the other one in the vertical uh, column. Okay, and this is exactly what this uh, systolic array does. I didn't want to go. Maybe I should use that. Okay. Um, so now, if you take these building blocks, then you can, in fact, do matrix multiplications where you encode the weights at each uh, crossing point in your MAC unit. So this is a multiplication factor of one. And then what you do is you stream your second matrix through this array bitwise. Um, so you see you have to do this in the right fashion. But if you were actually to follow the numbers, then you can see if you stream these uh, component Bs through in this uh, diagonal fashion, um, and you pass them in multiplication down to the further level, then in the end what you get is basically, um, again, the scalar product between rows and columns at the output, and it propagates piecewise through on the other side. So basically, you have an input stream, an output stream, and the weights are exactly sitting in the center. The crucial point here, however, is that you don't need memory access, because memory is stored directly where you need it for the multiplication. 
So there's no, nothing that basically fetches it from SRAM or DRAM, but it's already there. And all you have to do is uh, send, the, send the electronic uh, bits through. And if you think about this, this maps sort of naturally also to an optical system because there you could do exactly the same thing. You store the weight somewhere locally, and then you just stream uh, your data through. If you want to do this at high speed, this would be optical signals that pass through the same way. If you can implement this multiplication somehow with your internal hardware. And this is sort of what we are trying to do, or what uh, we have already done. Now, if you want to build this electronically, there's many, many ways uh, you can do, and some of them are actually very successful. These are just three examples that uh, you can use. Flash memory here is a, a very prominent one. Um, Memristos, we already mentioned, but also SRAM uh, is, is frequently used. So these are all devices that are already there. They all perform analog computation. So you uh, take your digital input, you convert it into currents or voltages, you pass them through your computational unit. Then at the output, you do the reverse process. So you take your analog signal, convert it back to digital. Um, and then you can basically embed that directly into your computing architecture. So all of these here are basically accelerators or matrix vector multiplications that take over some of the heavy load that you have in larger AI models. Can you give some numbers, like a sense what size of matrices process are multiplication? So these are big, those are uh, megapixel structures. Um, SRAM and Flash, of course, can be even bigger since uh, you, you know how to make this for memory devices. And um, all you do is you add the periphery to do the computation. So this enables really to also calculate the very, very big matrices in principle. Um, they're not always perfect because they're not all on volatile. And resources, for example, are. If you program the ways they stay there, also if the power is gone, other architectures don't. Um, but there's usually a trade off between volatility and, and, and speeds uh, for access as such. But in principle, it's stuff that's already there and you can, you can actually use it in, in your hardware. So I have two matrices one is constant and I put it there, and the other one comes. It's a high range, and it, just exactly. now and then I have to change the, the first matrix. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be fast. Exactly, since this is kind of what you want to do in these uh, models, also for recognition, you know the kernels that you need for uh, processing the images. So those are the ones that you store here, and then your image data that kind of gets passed through, and that you want to do, of course, very fast. Since in the end, the time from image input to classification that determines how fast you can. Drive the car in the end. So in the city, this is all okay, but if you are on the highway, maybe you want something a bit quicker. Well, sorry, it's yeah. a mega pixel, but it's the matrix uh, size or the input size? The, this is the matrix size. Okay, so it's like 1000 by 1000. Yeah, those are big ones. Uh, of course, only certain persons can build this. IBM can, for example. Um, but with that, you can really do large uh, scale data processing. And that's already there. You cannot buy it, but um, you, you can see it. <laughs> OK, um, yeah. But yeah, as I mentioned, you want to do this really fast. And with electronics, you can only go so fast because um, at the end, you reach the bottleneck of thermal load on your hardware. You still have this here, too. And therefore, the clock speed is limited. And now, of course, it makes sense to think about some, some quicker things. Um, and those are optical ones. Some of them were already shown here, um, especially in, in free space. And I think there's a lot of advantages for doing this in free space because that is inherently very parallel. Um, the advantage of going to a chip scale system is basically that you can scale, scale it easily by using top down fabrication of foundry surfaces. So if you think about a mass product or such, that you can also destroy it maybe. <laughs> In your car or something that has to be cheap, then it's good to use those, but both have their pros and cons. Um, and yeah, in, in some reviews, you can already see what, uh, where they shine, where they don't. Um, there's always a give and take with, with each of those technologies. But we are basically working on this side with uh, wave guide devices um, to implement these, these multipliers, basically. 
Now, why is this interesting? Um, from, from several points, one is obviously speed. Um, so if you have optical signals, they're used to multi gigahertz frequencies that match very naturally to high-speed processing and also maybe to fiber infrastructure. So if you only don't only think about autonomous driving, but maybe data centers or such, this might make a lot of sense. Um, you have very high frequencies, so clock speeds, lasers, detectors, all of this is already there, and it's very high speed. Um, and another very important feature, I think, is that you can do things in parallel. So this is something that is not possible with electronics, since there's only basically one type of electrons, um, at least in, in the processor. But in optical signals, you can use many other degrees of freedoms, be it the color, be it polarization, a spatial mode or so, all of this can be encoded in a fiber or a waveguide or something else. And therefore, you can transmit things and process things also in parallel, which makes a lot of sense. For example, if you have multiple cameras all going through the same kernel device. Or so. um, and therefore, you, even though these structures are relatively big, you will, in the end, if you look at some, at the right numbers. <laughs> so one of them is the latency, basically the time that it takes uh, for a given computation um, or a given classification. So in photonic systems, this is on the order of picoseconds or such. Uh, that's not super fast, but I think a comfortable number. Electronics, this is more on the nanosecond scale. So there already you have a very big improvement. Of course, your bandwidth, as we already heard, is on an entirely different scale. So I think 20 gigahertz is conservative, uh, but doable. Power is a nice metric if you look at the optics itself. So this is slow power. The electronics is a different story again, which you also need for these structures. Um, and the area in the end is comparable if you, if you choose the right approach. So if you look at these possible gains, then you see there's a lot to, to win. Of course, it's not there yet, but um, in these technologies, what you also care about is scaling into the future. So what you can show today is one thing. But how it looks in 10, 20 years or so is, is also important, and it should not separate, but ideally rise, since that demand is, is also rising very quickly. OK, so um, now if you want to use optics, um, then you have to build the same operations as in the systolic array, basically multiplications. Um, and you can do this in, in several ways. In a, in a chip-based system, I think there's sort of two broad categories. You can either work um, yeah, with interferometers, so sort of on the face, um, or you can work with the amplitude. Um, and I'll show you quickly how both of them work, even though we only use one of them. Um, but this is also where this field started with uh, the work from the Angle School at MIT. And uh, the talk also tomorrow will probably talk, uh, shed some more light on this. But in the end, um, it, it uses a building block that is, that is very common, basically an interferometer that has some integrated phase shifters. Um, so it's a two by two device, so have uh, two values as an input, two values as an output, and then the interferometer itself uh, implements a rotation of the light field. Um, so basically, if it's a low loss system, it's a unitary uh, rotation with, with an angle that you can basically encode with your phase shifter. Um, and if you look carefully at this, um, basically what you change is the splitting ratio between these structures, and that maps in a way um, also to a multiplication. Because you know your input power, you know the fraction of light that comes out of the output, and um, that is a multiplication, so input times fraction basically gives you a new number, and if you now measure the power at the output, you will directly get your result, but at, at optical speeds very fast. And the nice thing is, of course, if you can build one of these, then you can make many of them. And this is exactly the device uh, that was up, uh, put out a few years ago. And this is a uh, review the structure on that. So basically, uh, a cascaded system of many of these interferometers. If you zoom into them, you see exactly the structure from the previous slide. So the phase shifters here, at the input, and also at the output that we have full flexibility for encoding this rotation, and they are concatenated, and you can choose your rack scheme or other scheme that you want. Um, basically, what this thing does then is it converts an input vector of light field to an output vector by a unitary transformation, which is exactly your uh, multiplication. And then if you break that down into a diagonal, diagonalization, 
um, and the uh, factorization, then you have uh, the tools to implement any sort of uh, structure. How many uh, units are needed for an N by N matrix? Uh, you need quite a bit. <laughs> but is there a simple formula, a two of N, square root of N? For, for, for the interformulas itself? Yeah, so if you want to. So, I, I mean, if you zoom into this, you basically see uh, a lot of these here. So, each interformator is one part, and then if you want to go in, in n uh, rows, then you need n of rows, and in the common direction the same, so think of the squares. Um, all of the rest here is electrical control, since this is a programmable matrix with these thermal heaters that, that are sitting here for implementing the phase shift. You can also decide what sort of matrix you want to actually program. Um, Maybe the thermal ones are not the fastest, but there are other options to implement this, this regard in bio for such. So it's a very nice thing, and it has optical input, optical output, and as long as you don't take the power away from the heat, you will also have your, your weight stored directly in the matrix. How efficient are they? These heaters? No, the, the input to output optics without the coupling. Is it like 50%, 1%? Uh, this, I'm not the expert. Usually, of course, you have loss at each of these structures, of course. You can optimize them to a quite a good degree. Um, there's also several startups that pursue this like matter. Um, is I think, one that is, has made a lot of progress and actually has a 64 by 64 array um, that, that you can control digitally. Um, so, but these are sort of the sizes that you are probably talking about. So it's not a thousand by a thousand, rather uh, maybe a hundred by a hundred or so. But by programming these quickly with different approaches, um, you can always artificially enlarge the size of the matrix. Um, and of course, there is some loss, but um, this is manageable. Um, so you're not talking about you know, many orders of magnitudes, but some of them, since here you keep uh, all the input and output signals and only have uh, scattering loss at the structures or absorption loss at these, uh, these heaters. Um, and therefore, the, the power budget, if you only look at the optics, is actually quite good. But you need the electronic periphery, and I'll mention that later on. OK, so this is, uh, this is very nice. It also maps, of course, to other fields in quantum computing or such, where you need such rotations as well. And I think there's also a very natural connection between both fields. Um, but yeah, we, we do it somewhat differently. Because there's also the option of working on amplitude. Um, this may be lossier, but has some other benefits in terms of footprint, for example. Um, and it's also quite intuitive in terms of the physics, I would say. So if you want, again, to implement multiplication, what you do is you encode one factor on the amplitude of lights or the intensity, a second one on some sort of modulation or transmission value. And again, then the output is a tower measurement. If you measure that number, then you know exactly what the other the product is if you know input and attenuation. And of course, you can implement that nicely. So you set the amplitude with your single laser source, you set your transmission with a smart chip and you measure the output power with your favorite photo detector. So this is fast, this is fast, and as long as the fish chip is fast, everything else is, is fast too. And you can work with these sharp lines here. OK, so modulating the amplitude on a chip is uh, difficult if you want to do it in a non-volatile way. This is something that would be a nice feature, at least I think so. If you think about in-memory computing, because what you have learned you want to keep on your chip, Therefore, it makes a lot of sense to store it. Typical photonic materials don't allow you to do that so easily, and therefore we add a little extra onto them. And those are so-called phase change materials. And they're interesting because they can come into different uh, crystal compositions. They can either be a disordered uh, structure that does not have a long-range order, um, and that would be more an amorphous or a glass-like structure. Um, this particular number here for the refractive index is for the one that we use, uh, GST. It's a ternary alloy. Um, and you can see that it has a relatively high real part, um, but not so much absorption. So it's not a glass, of course, but it's glass-like. Um, but then, by some clever mechanism, if you switch the disordered structure into a crystal, 
Um, then the material properties change quite dramatically. So you see that the real part here goes up by 50%. This is already by itself quite a large margin. Um, and the other important bit is that the absorption, or so the imaginary part, also goes up by an order of magnitude. So you really have a very, very big change in optical refractive index that you can play with. Um, and that you don't get with these thermal optical uh, heaters or plasma dispersion effects or others effects that you may know. Um, there you uh, talk about uh, fractions of a percent or so, or even less, whereas here you really have a big uh, margin to play with. This is why we like it. And it's also something that is well established. It's in fact the stuff that is sitting on your rewritable DVDs, um, because of course this change in the imaginary part directly translates into a change of reflection. So if it's glass-like, you don't see much reflection, but if you look at it more like a metal, then of course you can read out the signal. This is done on the optical DVD. Um, so as I mentioned, we use a particular phase change material, GST. It's uh, one of the many options that there are in this uh, ternary diagram between tellurium, antimony, and germanium. And we work with this particular composition that is very well studied, that you can buy commercially. It's by no way the best material that is out there, but it's one that's very convenient because you go to a vendor, buy the target, and it has exactly this stoichiometry and with the properties that I showed you before. But if you are exploratory, then you can pick anything in here, and they all have the different features. Also, some have indeed much better features than, than GST. Okay. So what we do then is we take this material and we place it directly on top of a waveguide. So it's really a very simple device. So this is our light rail in which we propagate our signal. So basically the intensity amplitude that we wanted to set. Um, and then this little patch here that is sitting in the optical near field that modulates our transmission. So it encodes the weight in the matrix and we measure at the output. And if you plot this over time, basically, what we do is we send a light pulse in, we read a light pulse out, and the signal that we get at the photo detector is, of course, just this pulse with some amplitude that is set by the coupling losses, by the insertion loss, and so forth, anything that basically contributes to the waveguide. If it's in the amorphous phase, this is not very absorptive, so you get some sort of maximum value. If it's switched into the crystalline phase, um, then with the same signal, you get a much lower output because there is a coupling to the imaginary part, and therefore attenuation. And hence, what you get at the output is a somewhat reduced signal. And um, you're basically, your contrast that you work with, this is basically your storage capacity in this particular structure. So your analog numbers are encoded in the difference between these two levels. If you design this right, then there can be sufficient contrast to multiply. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, is, is absorption really the only mechanism, or is it also some form of the reflection? There is, of course, always a little bit. Um, it's not very significant because this patch is very thin, so a typical thickness is 10 nanometers. This is already enough to give you enough absorption. And if you look at the impedance at this particular cross section and that cross section, there is not too much mismatch, but you always have a little bit of loss. So these are not perfect. Um, if you're clever, you can, of course, help with the design by making it somewhat more adiabatic or so. Um, this is doable. Um, but in the simplest case, you live with the loss um, and mostly worry about the absorption, since that is much more dominant compared to the scattering and so forth. Um, but it is always there. And of course, you also get a little phase difference between these two structures because that's also this change in the real part. OK, so um, this is good for reading, but of course, you need to write into the structure, too. This you can do either electrically or optically. Um, here, I just show you the optical fit, since that's convenient for us. So you use a high-intensity pulse. It's actually so high that you go above the melting temperature of GST, which is around 600 Celsius, so quite warm. Um, then if you do this with a short pulse, basically what happens is you heat your material above the melting temperature, the atoms are free to move and wiggle around. Then if you rapidly remove the optical power, um, the heat dissipates into the waveguide surface. Uh, as I told you, it's very thin, so dissipation is a very fast mechanism, and hence the atomic order is melt quenched. 
and you're left with a disordered state, which is basically the amorphous uh, part of the structure. As you can also see, it doesn't switch the entire bit of the structure, but rather the area where the mode is most localized. Um, so what you see actually in this patch, if you look at it closely, is the, the mode structure of your waveguide somewhat centered in the, in the middle. Now, if you want to get rid of this again, you can erase it by using a slightly different pulse and you keep the temperature uh, elevated. So basically, you give it more time. And what happens then is you have a progressive crystallization. So you don't go all the way to melting, but rather above the glass transition temperature. Then you keep it warm, give the atoms time to reorder, and therefore you can sort of erase. It's flickering a bit. Raise a bit in the center that was there, and you're back with your crystalline state, and go back to your, your zero level value. So, how many cycles you can do before destroying something? Ah, you can do many. So, uh, we did up to 10 to the 7, probably you can do even more. From electrical switching, there are reports of 10 to the 15, so it's actually much better than flash. There is some degradation over time, um, but it can be cycled over and over again, in principle as long as you don't destroy it, which, which also happened. Um, OK, um, yeah, nicely enough, you can also see this directly um, on, the, uh, on the atomic level. So if you take a cut through this waveguide with, uh, and then look at it, it's a trans transmission electron microscope. And this is sort of the structure that we use. It's a silicon nitride waveguide, and then this 10 nanometer of GST sitting on top of it as the memory. There is a capping layer also to prevent it from oxidization. Also make sure that it doesn't fall into a little ball or so if you start the melting process. Um, and then in the amorphous phase, you see a no long-range order. So it's a, uh, in that FFT Fourier image, you basically see the central symmetric halos. Um, if it is switched, what you form are these little microcrystallites that you can kind of see here at the top. So it's not single crystal, but polycrystalline. And the size of them grows depending on how much power you dump into the material, but then if you again Fourier transform, you get very nicely the correct scattering peak of the target. So this reproduces the stoichiometry of what you bought off the shelf. And this is reversible, so you can do it many times and also encode different levels because you don't have to switch the entire film, but you can only choose to switch part of it. And so in principle, you have also a purely analog way of setting any weight between this minimum value given by absorption and the maximum given by transmission. Okay, so we can use this principle and now start building our device. And as I mentioned already, this works in parallel because if it works with one color, then of course it works also with many of them. If you have the right light source, that gives you a lot of these colors. And yeah, the most special part of this. Um, frequency comb is one of them. Yeah, others. Um, but anyway, it's a tool that's also already there in, in optics, and you can use it directly for speeding up your calculations quite dramatically on a chip by working uh, in parallel on such structures. So this is um, how we implement now our multiplication. Um, we use two-color or multicolor switching in order to avoid uh, uh, inter interference between different structures because in the end what you perform is a, is a power measurement so you want this to be reproducible and deterministic um, and if you encode your light signals on the same colors and send them through the same waveguide then strange things happen get sometimes interference sometimes not and your output power is really not defined and therefore if you encode your different vectors on different uh, light fields so here like the red one and the blue one then uh, both of them propagate in the same wavefront and they don't talk to each other. But if you only care about the power, this doesn't matter, since then you just get the superposition of both intensities and not the superposition of the amplitudes. So then our simple scalar multiplication is basically two input fields here, then two uh, transmission values, so one uh, uh, switch uh, GST element that is transmissive, and here another one that is absorptive, and, and then you measure the power, so one high amplitude and one low amplitude, and you basically get the multiplication and the addition of both uh, at the end of the waveguide. And that's the scheme to scale it up. Um, all we have to do is now make the circuit. Yeah? Just a quick question about the previous one. So do I understand right? So you have essentially the maximum transmission or the minimum transmission, and the way you do a 
multiplications by setting it somewhere in between, and that's how we store the, the constant we multiply by. It, it, exactly. So um, you, you program the weight in, in the phase composition of this little patch. So if you make it all crystalline, then it's your zero, as to speak. If you would make it all amorphous, then it's your one. Um, and then if you choose a partial crystallization, you can, in principle, pick any value between these two. And this is what is written in these patches. Then we set the uh, light amplitude, so this is something we know also. Um, and if you measure the power at the output, then you get all the sum of the different contributions. Just how accurate can you be in setting it? So if it's uh, set with a single pulse, then uh, it goes to about five bit precision. If you do closed cycle programming, which you can also do by uh, going closer and closer to your desired value, then you do much better in the principle. The question of how quickly you want to be in your scheme, um, the single pulse is of course the easiest, but there is some fluctuation and variation. You want to be more precise if you do this iteratively, and then in principle you have any number. Of course, your contrast depends on the size of the structure. If you make it very big, then there's a big uh, contrast that gives you, in principle, more levels. Um, but you also have more loss, so this is all kind of a trade-off in the end. Okay, but that's at least how we use. Um, you always lose some power, but yeah, that's uh, that's the game, I guess. Okay, we built these uh, structures uh, in the clean room ourselves, so um, they are designed with this Python-based framework. So the pink lines are basically the waveguides. Um, there are some access for making electrodes and so forth. You also see some coupling structures and calibration structures on this particular chip. And that is translated to EBIM format. We write them with this 100 kb system, we edge them. Um, if it's done right, they also come out more or less like this. This is a scanning electron microscope image of such a cascaded interferometer structure. Um, and if you want to use this, you can also use it. Uh, this is open source code and uh, quite flexible actually for, for building these photonic circuits for the chip scale. Um, it's of course not the scale that you would get at the foundry, but the big benefit is that the turnaround time is very quick. So principally you can make these chips depending on the complexity, anywhere between a day or a month or so. Um, and then you iterate the design to, to go to more and more fancy structures. The typical size that, that we use is about 15 by 15 millimeters, and then we measure it with fiber access. So if you saw, there are these uh, grating input ports here, the little triangles that are probably very hard to see, but they terminate the waveguides and therefore provide the input ports for such structures. And then by making many of them in parallel and measuring that with a fiber array, you in principle have all you need to reading out these matrices. Since there you need parallel input, parallel output, and the rest is all external periphery for doing the uh, modulation. Well, where does the writing light enter to the same pose? Yeah, uh, it depends a little bit on the design. So um, if it's a big matrix, what uh, turned out to be easier is to put an additional coupling port at each side for setting the weights. And with that, you can very targetly address one of them. Otherwise, we have to go through the rows and the columns. Um, you use the two-pass switching scheme, for example, to only switch it if they overlay. This way, you can address also particular elements. It's not the most convenient way, but it's all optically and yeah, doing it electrically would be nice, but it's another level of complexity. Okay, so this is we use for mapping, and then um, we basically have to put it all together. So instead of just making two couplers, you can make an entire row here. So you have your input waveguides, um, then the output waveguide where you want to measure the state of product. Then the link is done with a directional couple, so we take some of the light from this horizontal waveguide and translate it to the vertical one. And then the weight is encoded on this particular directional couple so that it only modulates this portion of the light field. And, and then you get the product of the input vector times this weight vector at the output for your power measurement. Then to encode the light field, we use electro optical modulators that are not on the chip, um, but they're fast. And then the source is a frequency cone, as I mentioned, um, that addresses one of these rows with each a different color. And then to make a matrix out of it, you add the other ones and 
where you basically have it. So you put your weights directly in this GST element. You measure the output here at the end. Um, and then you have a little photonic processor, processor that takes over some of the matrix vector multiplication. It does this actually quite fast. So um, since uh, the comb has a lot more lives than we actually need, you can also do more vectors in parallel. So in, in our experiment, we were able to do four at a time um, at a maximum modulation of, of 14 gigahertz. So with this little four by four, what you get is about 0.9 para mag operations per second. Um, but it's a passive chip at the active bit is all the periphery. So this is the part what you now have to take care of and go further in the integration um, to add more and more things. If you do this parallel processing, um, something else that you need is uh, wavelength division multiplexing, since you need to be able to separate out each individual wavelength, which gets quite cumbersome. So on the setup, uh, I'll show you a picture later. Um, there are many of AWGs to uh, plug these different frequencies apart, um, which is also a problem. We therefore, find a very hard on putting them on the chip as well. So the idea is basically to not just have the passive matrix on the chip, but also the multiplexers and demultiplexers, um, so that you only have uh, fiber input, um, but not the state uh, silica ratings, uh, silica components that, that do the wavelength composition. Also, another drawback of the scheme that I showed you earlier is that you only have phase between zero and one, so it's very hard to make negative numbers, which of course also one for your photonic models. Um, and therefore, you need to do a further trick by doing a reference measurement, which you can also do by going away from the single uh, coupler cell to a multi coupler cell. And here you can also see the, the switching scheme that you asked about. So, Basically, this is one unit cell of such a matrix, but it's now composed of two waveguides that uh, go out in parallel. Um, and if you take the difference between these two with the right reference value, um, then you can basically take that to calibrate out any defects that the matrix has. So wavelength dependence of the directional coupler, um, but also the offset that you get from the input light that is left at the output. By then doing balance detection, um, this in principle gives you the, the ways to also do negative numbers. Plotted here on the right hand side is the, um, the change in transmission. If you measure this device as a function of frequency, since it's, it's a balanced uh, detection, you see that it's actually quite good. So over this uh, 100 nanometer window, more or less the error is very small, so hence you have uh, sufficient bandwidth to basically put all the phone lines into the measuring device. So the GST weights are set with this external input port here. This is no longer rating for the different 3D structure. Uh, but in principle, there you have a direct access to the GST patch, which is sitting on this little cross to program the weight, essentially. OK, then the second edition is a multiplexer. And this, of course, also exists very nicely in the toolbox of nanophotonics. You have to optimize it a little bit, but if you do so, you can selectively pick uh, some wavelengths very nicely. And this is Frank's work with Bragg filters. In principle, it's a Machzehnter interferometer with an encoded modulation of the wavelength that is matched to a particular wavelength that you want to take out. So basically, you get your filtered event in the uh, drop port here in the end. Um, and that is beneficial because then you can also cascade it. So this is a device with three individual filters after each other. So if you measure that, then you get very high extinction ratio of, uh, of 70 dB here. Um, and you can place them on different wavelengths that you want. So here's a filter for, again, four wavelengths, uh, each with a certain bandwidth for encoding the vectors. But now uh, with each particular frequency range that you can use for the encoding. Of course, the device gets bigger, but yeah, that's the price you pay. And now if you put this together with the matrix, with the balance detection as well, then you now in principle have a fully functional system that can encode again four by four numbers, but now positive and negative. Um, and you don't need to worry about all the external wavelength uh, problems, uh, but they're all sitting on the chip. This is a big bank here of multiplexers. They're very long, but uh, not very thick. Um, therefore, you can place them nicely. And at the bottom, you have the big input array for, for all the fibers that go into this particular structure. 
Okay, so um, in the last, ah, yeah, I, I was going to show you first set of pictures. Um, so this is basically the first thing that we used, and uh, at the very beginning you see the frequency cone, um, that the chip is actually somewhere at the center, it's a small bit, and there's a lot of periphery again for the amplifiers and so forth. Here you see the stack of the uh, AWGs, so this is why we actually wanted to have them on the chip. This is a, a lot of fibers and stuff, a lot of detectors also here. The chip you don't even see, but this is the smallest part of the optical cable, um, and hence it's a bit uh, bulky. The second iteration that Daniel Frank and Yvonne built is already a lot more compact. So this is a one by one uh, meter where you have a meter box where you have the chip sitting under the microscope. Uh, this is the microscope here to monitor it. Um, the chip is underneath on, on the stage here. Um, this one has now the modulators, detectors, and so forth, and the FPGA, FPGA for reading out the electrical signals. All integrated, so in principle, it is portable, and it was uh, ported also to uh, the collaborator once. Um, but of course, you want to do better and put this all on a chip. So this is actually what we are trying uh, next in, a, in the European project, um, where we don't just want the uh, multiplexers and the passives, but also the actives on the chip. Um, and since it's difficult to do this all on one particular material platform, it makes sense to combine different ones together in a hybrid fashion since some things you can do better on others. So our idea was basically to build the microphones in silicon nitride, where you get very high Q devices um, with different approaches. Um, but it's a passive material, so we don't like it for modulation. So uh, therefore, this we do with an active bit in indium phosphide. Uh, where you have very high frequency modulators and so forth. Um, and then the matrix multiplier with GST is sitting on a silicon photonics chip where you have the detectors in principle, modulators also. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, the, the problem is now that you have three different platforms and you need to bring them all together, as we do with uh, 3D printed interconnects that are loss less, less, less enough that you can compensate the loss at each interface with these additional amplifiers that are sitting before the input phosphide modulator. It's a bit uh, challenging to build, so I have to say, but nevertheless, the numbers would be nice if you can get there. So it's a 25 by 25 matrix, um, has 16 parallel backgrounds. So each input has 16 wavelengths for encoding. And then the modulation that is done by the indium phosphide here is 20 gigahertz, so that works. It gives you about three meta mic operations per second, which would be nice how you get the data into this chip. I don't know, but as a performance benchmark, it, it would be good. Okay, so there is uh, there's also a short movie of how this would work. Uh, basically, it's uh, these slides quite dark. But anyway, these three different platforms that are coming together, the frequency code here for setting the light fields and into phosphide for modulation and detection here at the outputs. So the lasers are also integrated on this chip. They drive the uh, gallery modes here. With a modular process, you get the different comb lines that then go into this indium phosphide chip here, which basically sets the input or is the way where we talk to the external world. So basically your image would come in from here and would be scanned through uh, row by row therefore adjusting the intensity on each of these comb lines that are then transformed to the matrix. So the power would somehow fluctuate over time. Then on the silicon matrix, the addition and multiplication is done. So all the different colors are summed up at each particular waveguide, which is terminated with a photo detector. And that is basically the result that we get from all of this. Um, of course, you have to uh, convert that back to a digital. So after each detector, there is an analog to a digital converter that has to work at 20 gigahertz. Also not so easy to do. Um, but then in the end, you have an interface where you have digital in, digital out, and put, in principle, put that also into an HPC architecture. There is uh, some progress on building that. So critical bit is the modulator. This we do also in the hybrid technology with uh, Fraunhofer Institute in Berlin. Look, not too fast. So basically, um, 
the AWG is done in a polymer technology, and, and only the indium phosphide modulator and amplifiers are done on this very small section. This has to be done because the indium phosphide waveguides are actually quite lossy. So if you also make this big AWD on the same chip, then you have to amplify it even more, which is problematic and therefore turns out to be easier to stick uh, two polymer uh, multiplexers uh, around this little indium phosphide chip. We need 25 of those for each input waveguide, so big system. Then to connect them, this is what Daniel is doing. So this will be done with these 3D printed structures. So basically we take our small waveguide, taper it out to expand the mode, then add a little lens at the output. This can be printed on each platform by, uh, by a manuscript system, essentially with, with good alignment. And if they are designed right, they are also quite low loss. So this particular structure here has an insertion loss of about, uh, or coupling loss of about one dB at the best point. Um, but a relatively wide bandwidth, which is the second factor that we of course need for this chip because the frequency comb somehow has to go into the silicon waveguide and with grating couplers you don't have uh, sufficient uh, bandwidth to, to fix that. Also they're nice because they're quite intolerant to alignment uh, misplacement, so even if you move them around by a few microns, you still get comparable accuracy and this is good because this matrix has many, many inputs and all of them need to match, and that, that is of course challenging. Okay, so if you then go even further, then uh, you need something else. So this is what the startup is doing. Um, building the photonic chips is one thing, but you need all the electronic uh, backend as well. So essentially an ASIC that does the fast AD conversion, the synchronization, the DA conversion, um, the interface to PCI Express or whatever you want to use. This is what Salience is trying to do. And then if you stack this all together in principle, there is your photonic coprocessor that would help AI in the long range. Maybe this is all nonsense, but maybe not. <laughs> so if you listen to this collaborator guy again, um, so this is the ex boss of Volkswagen. So he basically says uh, energy is uh, the big problem that we have at the moment, but maybe optical neural networks could be one solution. So I think this is something that's very much in the spirit of this workshop. So if you listen to Hank, you are basically on the right track. Okay, and with that, I'm going to thank the people that are actually doing this. I'm probably the most useless person in the whole group. Um, they are doing the hard work here in the lab, doing the fab the design and come up with lots of clever tricks for measuring that. Also a lot of collaborators in Oxford, we get actually the face change materials. Um, Exeter does a lot of theory for us. We work uh, with Tobias at EPFL for the frequency combs. Also with Abu Sebastian on the algorithm design. And with that, I stop. And thank you for your So uh, here's my question. Um, um, so the, the, the chip design was very interesting, uh, but it was kind of a focus on the, how do you say, an inference stage where you are already a trained network and you want to do all the application and you get Now let's say we want to look at the training stage, which means now you need to update those matrices more often. Yeah, yeah. What would be you know, your comment on that? So there are different ways of doing that. This is, of course, yeah, one of the things we would also like to have. Um, and there are different ways of achieving that. You can stick with PSD um, and go away from the optical switching to electrical switching. So this actually also works quite nicely. And you can make this compact also by adding the plasmonic elements that we've heard about as well. So the combination here also works. This way you get localized access, but you can program them with electrical signals. So if you combine these uh, electrical modulators with the waveguides, then in principle you have a programming capability that is non-volatile away uh, as well. Um, and the GSD can switch very quickly. So this happens on a picosecond to a nanosecond time scale, at least in one direction. So in principle, you can update these rates also at relatively high speeds. If you want to do it differently, in principle, all you need is a modulator. So you can 
pick your favorite modulator platform and combine that as well. And on the silicon platform, there are already some. So you have these uh, PIN uh, structures that use the plasma dispersion effect, and they are very fast. You have three resonator based structures, Marcellor based structures. If you go to active platforms, they are already embedded in this indium phosphide approach, for example. Um, and now, if you have those, then you can, of course, change your weights on the fly, but they are all volatile. So if you take your power off, um, your weight is gone, but maybe you don't care. So I think um, this is the sort of game you can play. You put um, some way of uh, attenuating on the waveguide. Um, you just have to figure out something that's compatible with your technology. But there are ways, and it just gets a bit more complex. <laughs> so to okay. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so you mentioned that the benefit of the intensity-based approach is that we don't have to be with phases. So I was wondering when you're adding the intensities together, does the relative phase of the two uh, light packets matter? Do they distractively interfere sometimes? Yeah, this is exactly why we work on different wavelengths. If if they were, if they're close together, then of course there is this interference, and we measure that too. Um, so you need sufficient offset um, that they are completely decoupled, basically, in, in wavelengths. Um, the, the nice thing about this matrix approach is that um, you, you can, in principle, work with low-cost lasers. You don't need very good coherence time or anything. You only need intensity, um, and in fact, it's even better if they are not coherent. So you can also use a diode if that fits into the spectral window, um, and then just measure the, the sum of the individual components at the output. But they are, um, because if they are sitting on different wavelengths, all you have to do is make sure that they don't talk to each other in, uh, in the wave space, and that can be done. Thank you. Okay, could you just show them the whole Um, yeah, you get them, of course, some uh, time delays between individual paths, but um, as long as your system is not operating on, on those scales, you probably don't care. And um, the distances that we typically have are much, much smaller than anything that you get. So, uh, like if it's a centimeter, then we're talking about 100 picoseconds or so. Um, so, these are very different numbers. These devices usually fit into a wide field or at least a few on the e beam. So, it's on a millimeter scale. Um, and there, your um, delay times between different, different lengths are not as critical. Um, this is also one thing that is nice about uh, incoherent work because you, you don't care about phase offset or such. In the interferometers, you probably have to do this a bit more carefully, but with a clever design, this is all doable. Since you, you have full flexibility on the chips, you can also go in bands up and down to compensate for length offset. Other questions? And for the last part that you showed with the Indian Postman, so you mentioned the 3D printed interconnects. So you have like multiple small chips that are connected together or yeah, so it, it goes in many stages. So uh, so we start with the silicon nitride one and then we print these uh, these ball lenses on the facet, so across the facet actually. And so there you have a pollinated beam in free space, and that we catch again with the second matching one that is sitting on the next platform. So it's actually not the indium phosphide directly, but this uh, polymer board. Um, since the, uh, the indium phosphide bit is sandwiched directly between two of these uh, polymer written structures. So the, the interface is on the polymer itself, which is somewhat nice since they're quite big, therefore aligning is less critical. Um, but then the other step is again more difficult for the silicon chip, you need to do the fine features again. Um, but the idea is always that we have sort of a collimated uh, beam in free space that we know the properties of and then we catch it with a matching lens at the other side. And you have to make sure that all is level in the, the devil's in the detail. <laughs> okay, last question. Last year, if you at the 20 gigahertz, are you worried about the signal to noise ratio? Yeah, 
of course, uh, that, that all is, uh, is uh, a big piece of engineering. Also, you have to make sure that, of course, the wavelengths fit into your channel spacing. Right? So you have at least 20 gigahertz offset between each wavelength. Um, so the 16 uh, wavelengths that you have in each channel need to actually to fit into your filter. And they shouldn't overlap with the next one. So yeah, all of this you have to do. You have also have to make sure that you have enough signal uh, between the neighboring channels here, since uh, anything that swaps into the second multiplex or basically the photo detector as well, the photo detector has noise and so forth. Um, so how much signal space you will get in the end is this. So let us move further questions to, to the lunch and let's thank Yeah. 